Welcome to the Restored Church Podcast, where we prize Jesus, make disciples, and love well while restoring community. We are so glad you're here, and wherever you're listening from, we believe you will be more acquainted with the heartbeat of God through today's message. What uh, what a good morning so far. Uh, I am encouraged and excited for today. Uh, as you can tell, um, today is... It's a day we get to do some baptisms. Um, you, you can see we have a new device, um, which is great. It's uh, it's nice. Uh, I <laughs> uh, when we were, when we were filling the the yesterday, um, we had this concern of uh, that 250 gallons of water equals out about 2,000 pounds, and we were filling it on this pod out here, and uh, it struck us: will it hold it? Uh, and so we're like, oh, I don't know. I looked underneath it. I'm like, still questionable. So, so I call, I called the one uh, who who designed it and made it. And I was like, hey, bro, you think you think this will will hold 2,000 pounds of water? He's like, mm, I think so. <laughs> think so. Well, uh, great. We'll give it a shot. <laughs> so we thought about moving it on the ground. We're like, nah, we'll keep it up here and let tomorrow be exciting. So hopefully, hopefully we're good. It seems pretty pretty uh, stable. Uh, I will say uh, when we filled it, the water was crystal clear, which is unlike anything we've had here. Uh, and then we, we added some thing, chemicals to it and now it's back to brown. So I think, I think God's like, you need warm brown water at Restored Church. And so that's what we use for baptisms. It looks more like a river. All right. We can even like, in case you don't know, this is a hot tub. We can turn the bubbles on, make it living water, running water, either way. Um, we had to cover it last night so we wouldn't find Scott in there this morning soaking. <laughs> Anyways, uh, man, it is, a, it is a good morning. It is good to be here. If you're new here, this is your first time. Um, we sit around round tables because we believe it invites community. Uh, we believe it helps us break down the walls that are naturally there and allows us to kind of converse while we wait on the service to start, while... We uh, uh, leave. We love what it does. Also, it's not not a bad spot to put your coffee and Bible as you take notes, and so um, it works out well. Um, but thank you for being here. Uh, I am excited for this morning, um, and uh, we're we're in the Book of Acts. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Acts chapter four. But before I do that, I, I almost forgot, and I, I won't. Uh, we I do have a couple announcements to make, housekeeping items. First one is, for those of you who've been with us, we changed our name uh, in January, changed it from Crosslink Community Church to Restored Church. Now, some of the things that went along with that, um, that we um, have been kind of navigating and working through is um, our Facebook page. Our Facebook page has the Restored logo, but still the Crosslink name. And what we um, have not been able to do or get Facebook to do is to change that name. So I'm going to start this service this way. I'm actually going to ask you, everyone, to get your phones out. Like right now, just get them out. If you, if you use or have social media, get them out. Because here's what we did. We uh, created, that we launched today, a new uh, Facebook page for uh, uh, Restored Church. And so the other one's going to stay up for a little while, but it's going to direct people, hopefully, to Restored. So there's a QR code. Uh, is on the table, right? Oh, they're not on the tables. Uh Oh, well, we forgot to put those out. Either way, Restored Church, um, uh, you should be able to find it, hopefully, and like it. (laughs) That's what we want you to do, um, just to help us gain some of that traction. So, uh, like I said, the other one will stay up. We have gone back to live streaming services, but we don't do it on Facebook. It goes to YouTube. And so, when we do have those cards on the table next time, um, it'll give you links to all of our social media um, stuff, or you can get it on the back on your way out. Um, but we, uh, we would like your help in that. The other thing is we have a new member of the family. Uh, Tulsi was born um, on, on February 29th. Of course, uh, like that's a good way to save on birthdays. I'm telling you, Ryan did it well. Um, but yeah, the baby, was, well, Lainey actually gave birth. Uh, either way, uh, Tulsi is here and great. So um, thank you for all of your help in that. All right, let's hey, let's dive in. Uh, Acts chapter four. Um, I grew up in church. I don't 
I don't know how many of you, like it was your lifestyle, your family kind of practice, but I grew up going to church and, um, and we were sitting around the table last night talking with, with my kids and we were talking about certain Bible stories. And, and because my wife and I were like entrenched in like church, there's a lot of things that we learned through, uh, Bible school. And I don't know if anyone remembers Awanas, anyone? All right, so so Awanas and Bible school uh, or Sunday school, either one, uh, is is kind of what like ingrained in us all these stories. Like like there was a puppet team. I remember a puppet team. Do you, anyone know that blue puppet with the long head? Uh, look, it's frightening. Look at them later. Um, this is what they used to terrify little kids to you know say yes to Jesus. Either way. Um, I remember, but you, they used to depict like the stories of old and to see all these things. And, and even throughout the new Testament, and I, you've heard me talk about the flannel board that you put Moses up on the thing and they would share these stories. And, and like, I think there's something that has been lost, um, because we don't do some of those traditional things anymore, like Sunday school, where kids get to hear some of these stories. And as I was reading through Acts chapter four, um, it just reminded me of, a couple of things. One, how I grew up kind of engulfed in the church, but how it also didn't always look like what was experienced here in Acts. And I, and I want to be a church that, that loves, loves the scripture, that we handle it rightly, that, that it is what we come together to study together, but that scripture in itself will point to Jesus and will cause you and I to want to know him deeper and to love people more. And, and I think what we will see in Acts chapter four is, is that. So um, we're going to do all of Acts chapter four, right? We'll get through it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read it all. So you see this kind of play out and then we'll walk back. We'll walk back through it. Ready? All right, good. Acts chapter one or four, not one. Acts chapter four, verse one. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day. For it was already evening, but many... Many of those who have heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with uh, Annas and the high priest, Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power? Or by what name did you do this? Now, pause for a second. Those of you who were not here with us last week, Peter and John went to the temple to pray. And as they were going to the temple to pray, there was this man who's been lame from birth who was asking, begging for gold and silver. Peter says, gold and silver, I do not have, but in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. This guy was miraculously healed. Immediately, instantaneously healed. Was lame since birth, now was healed, clung to Peter and John and moved forward with them through the temple. And then a crowd gathered, obviously because of this miraculous event. Now there's a large, massive crowd. And so what Peter decides to do is now there's a crowd. I'm going to teach and preach. He did what he learned from Jesus. Jesus would teach and preach because crowds were coming to him and he wanted them to know the truth. And so this is what was happening. Well, similar to Jesus, the rulers and the scribes and the elders and the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they didn't like what was going on. So they came to inquire on behalf of Peter and John of how or by what power or by what name uh, did you do this miracle? And now emboldened Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, 
whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, him, this man is standing well or before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And look at verse 12, man, if you underline or highlight. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. I, I cannot express to you following a miraculous moment. Peter's message was how a heart can be rescued and saved. And the only, the only way the only way to be rescued and saved is through Jesus. And so it's almost like he's using this miracle that took place as an example or um, a testimony of the power of um, God through Jesus that can also awaken a dead heart. And still today, the, re the reason why, the reason why we've, in American Christianity, of um not seen, I believe, God move in um, some beautiful or miraculous ways is because we've stopped teaching and preaching Jesus. We've made it about one-liners and we've made it about um, uh, three to four steps on how to live your best life now. We've stopped teaching Jesus. And the only, the only name that can awaken hearts is Jesus. The only one who can take dead people, make them alive is Jesus. Can take lost people, make them found is Jesus. What we need more of is Jesus proclaimed. And so when I looked this morning at the list of songs that we were doing, uh, Sierra and I didn't talk about she'll never know where I'm at because I never know where I'm at um, in, in the text because it could change. And so um, we, didn't, we didn't consult about the songs, but the fact that we did three songs that literally proclaimed and magnified the name of Jesus is just to underpin what we're reading here in the text. Look at verse 13. This is my favorite verse in all of Acts. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men. They were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if your coworkers like walked away from an, a, a moment with you and thought to themselves, it's clear that he or she has been with Jesus. Can you imagine if the way we spoke, the way we prayed, the way we lived, the way we loved, that people would rub shoulders with us and have this conclusion, they have been with Jesus. It, it's, it seems to be abundantly clear. And I think a lot of us in this room, we get comfortable with playing the church games, doing uh, what we think is right and necessary, trying to be just a better person. And I'm here to tell you uh, what we need more of is not Jeremy 2.0, but Jeremy that magnifies Jesus and that when people engage with me, they have seen Jesus. That's, that's what it says that we are change one glory and one degree of glory to the next. That what we need more of are believers in this room that want Jesus to be seen. And like, I know they're pointing it out because the way Peter spoke was bold. What they were saying was clear. And they're like, man, these guys are uneducated and they're common. But they spent three years with Jesus and it changed everything about them. That was three years. And most of the time with them, they were confused. They didn't get it right. But now filled with the Holy Spirit, standing emboldened to proclaim that this is and will always be about Jesus, their conclusion is these men have been with Jesus. Look at verse 14. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition uh, but when they had commanded them to leave the council, 
they conferred with one another, saying, what shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in his name. Now, <laughs> this is reminiscent of Matthew 21. You can read it later when Jesus is confronted and they are asking him, by what authority do you do these things? And he says, let me ask you a question. John the Baptist, is he from man or heaven? Like he has, and they, they kind of huddle together to try to figure out how to answer Jesus. Same thing's going on here. What do we do? There's clearly a miracle that happened, something going on, but we need to make sure that this doesn't spread. How can we contain this? You can't, all right? I just let you know, you cannot contain it. Jesus will spread like wildfire. But either way, they're trying to contain it. And even as they're huddling together, they can't even say his name. Did you see it? Like, hey, guys, we need to figure out what we need to do here. We can't let people talk in his name. Like, they're so bitter, so frustrated that in this moment, as they're trying to figure out how to stop it, they can't even say the name of Jesus. That's the kind of power that name has. So they're like, man, we need to keep people from speaking about this name. Verse 18. So they called them. And changed them not to, or and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. <laughs> but Peter and John answered. Now keep in mind, I'm going to continue to remind you. Peter, just I don't know, 60 days ago, however many, denied Jesus before a little girl at a campfire. And now he's been arrested standing before um, this council, and this is what they are going to tell him. So they called them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For this man, uh, for the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. That just to underscore, this had to be God. Had to be God at work. So when they were, were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of Father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they gathered together was shaken. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul and no one said that of, of any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. And there was not a needy person among them. 
For as many who are owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid at the apostles' feet, and it was um, distributed to each as any had need. Then thus Joseph, who is also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. I, I have a simple kind of four observations of what does it look like, according to this text, to be a person filled with the Holy Spirit who has been with Jesus. Like, like what, what does it change? I think we see the change in the midst here. And so what I want us to do is align our hearts and our lives with what does it look like to be people who have been rescued and redeemed, filled with the Holy Spirit, and who have been with Jesus. Now, now here's the one thing. I, I, we're going to do baptisms. We're going to do baptisms in a little bit. And uh, I know a lot of, like, we, we're going to celebrate because it's, there's a reason to celebrate. But, but baptisms, for me, in the church anymore, um, I'll, just, I'll say it this way. People get baptized, and then they walk away. I've seen it countless times. Like, it happens over and over again. It's almost like we make this the climactic point. And once this happens, everything else or the journey with Jesus feels less significant. And I'm here to tell you, this right here is not the climactic point. What it is, is what is Jesus doing in your life right now? I don't want to hear about your testimony, what he did and how he changed you. What's he doing right now? Have you been with Jesus this week? It's not about did you confess your belief and trust in him, but are you actively, constantly, consistently longing to be with Jesus? Because it's clear that those who have been rescued, redeemed, and filled with the Holy Spirit and have been with Jesus, when other people run into them, they say they have been with Jesus. So what does that look like? I'm, four things, I think. There's probably more, but in this text... Four things. The first thing that we notice for those who have been filled with the Holy Spirit and have been with Jesus, they speak boldly and elevate the name and power of Jesus above everything else. I don't know if you saw, look back at chapter four, when they're confronted by the religious leaders of the day, the powerful people of the day, when they're confronted by them, brought, brought in, Verse 10 says this, let it be known to all of you, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, like he didn't need to add that. Like he'd be canceled today. If you're talking to the important people, Let's set the stage. They were the ones who told people how to live and what to do. They were your politicians. They were your law enforcement. They were your lawyers. They were the important people. And Peter, a common, uneducated man, stands up emboldened by Jesus to speak truth into the lives of those who did not want to hear it and had every ability to do something about it. And he doesn't just say it's by the name of Jesus, but uh, let me remind you who Jesus is. He's the one you crucified. They weren't worried about being offensive. Not for the sake of being offensive, but for the sake of Jesus. Because the only heart, the only, the only name that can change the hearts in this room is Jesus. Listen, not, nothing raises the temperature in a room I'm not talking about a church room. Nothing changes the climate in a room like saying Jesus and sex. Like those two, just saying like they changed the climate immediately. You just felt it. Either way, the name of Jesus changes the climate of the room unlike anything else. It's that powerful. So look at what he says here. Verse 12. 
Uh, we'll do 11. This Jesus in the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Not, o- not only are they boldly speaking the gospel, unashamedly, unabashed, but they're saying a couple things that are offensive. One, Jesus, whom you crucified, didn't stay dead, and he has the power to rescue and redeem people. He actually is the only name that can do that. And so by saying that, he's telling them what you have been teaching, what you're doing, how you're trying to control and change lives can't happen that way. It can only happen through Jesus. And here's what we have. Pastors, preachers, and teachers who stand up and say that Jesus is one of the ways. That just sprinkle a little bit of him in, or it could be another God. You know what? All God's meet at the same place. This is not the case. Let it be said here at Restored Church that there is only one way by one name, and it's Jesus. And listen, that's good news. Here's why it's good news. You can stop trying to figure out other ways. Because all the other ways will tell you how to make yourself better to get there. And Jesus says, you can't make yourself better to get there. That's why I came to do this for you. So Jesus Christ came down into the fray of our lives, did what we could not do to pay our penalty, to do our death so that you and I can have life through his resurrection. So, so this is good news. It's good news. So... The second thing, observation that I see of people who are filled with the Holy Spirit and have been with Jesus is they gratefully endured hatred and persecution. They weren't rescued from it. They endured through it. Like what we see in this text is that a beautiful, amazing, celebratory thing happened. A man who was lame is now walking. The crowds were coming in. They were preaching and teaching who the power this came through was Jesus. And then all of a sudden, they're now arrested, dragged in, put overnight, um, waiting for these other people to confront them. And they gratefully endured that. In fact, I just want to, I want to show you. Uh, these are going to go up on the screen. You'll have to turn there. But in John 15... There's a few things that Jesus tells his disciples to get ready for. And here, here's the first one. John 15, verse 18 says this. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, or because you are not of the world. Wait, let me move this out of the way. <laughs> uh If you're of the world, um, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Man, can you just let that sit for a moment? I I think for, for so long, we've just been trying to be in the world, but not of it, but to look as closely like it as we can so that we're not hated. Like, we can't have our tax exemption taken away. Oh, I can't, I'm not supposed to, I don't go political. But man, why, why are we starting to look more like the world and less like Jesus? It seems like the message that Jesus preached caused people to gravitate towards him. And the message that we are teaching in the churches today are so watered down or confusing that it's either giving people false hope who do come or it's pushing people away because they don't seem it to be relevant. Listen, those who are rescued, redeemed, filled with the Holy Spirit and have been with Jesus more than likely are going to face persecution and hatred along the way. It's going to happen. He says it again. Look at John 17, John 17, starting in verse 14, says this. Uh, 
I have given them your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth, and your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for the sake, I consecrate myself that they also may sanctify it in, in truth. Peter was bold and endured the persecution that he faced. I think because he was already prepped by Jesus, maybe if they're hating you, you're doing something right. But there's another concept to this I want you to see before we dive into the third point. In their prayer, he says this in verse 23, when they got together, their friends reported the chief priests and the elders and said to them, and when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in it. This word choice he's using here, this Sovereign Lord is saying, you are Lord over our arrest and you are Lord over our release. And we're good with that. In their prayer, they are not only enduring the, the persecution and the hatred, but they're saying, hey, we know you're sovereign over all in control of everything. So we also know that it was in your plan and purpose for us to be arrested, to endure that, then to be released, to come back here, to pray to you, to say thank you for being sovereign over everything. We don't, we don't do that, just to be honest. Something doesn't go our way, we complain. This is terrible. Why would I go through this? I'm a good person. Let that person go through it. They're not as good as me. We don't acknowledge that maybe what God is doing here is that he is still very sovereign over everything. And that instead of asking God to try to change our circumstances, we see what we can learn from them or more importantly, how we can show Jesus in them? The third thing. For people who, who have been rescued, redeemed, filled with the Holy Spirit, and have been with Jesus, they pray fervently and together. Did you see what happened after they were released? When they were released, they went back to their friends. Maybe I could just pause here and say, um, do, the, do the friends that you go back to coming out of a difficult moment pray with you and extol the name of Jesus or complain with you and agree with you on why you shouldn't have walked through what you walked through? I, I, think, I think there's a lot to be said here that as Peter, James, and John were walking this thing out, as Peter and John were here teaching and preaching, as they saw some miraculous things, that when they went back somewhere, when it went back to where they had a moment to kind of release and, and just kind of let their guard down, they went back to friends who lifted their voices together with them in prayer. I think most of us in this room probably have some friends we probably need to get rid of because they're not pointing us to Jesus, they're actually pulling us away from it's, listen, I know this is crazy. I, I, church has become this, this thing anymore that place you show up instead of a place you're a part of. But this is what this is for. Church exists to give you friendships that join with you in prayer, whether you're going through a sorrowful moment or a celebratory moment. If you're lonely and you're wondering why you're always depressed and always being pulled away from the church, it's probably because you've isolated yourself from the church and stayed with the connections and the groups of people that you have that don't encourage you towards Jesus. I'm saying, how about you invest with your time and your heart and your mind and your energy with those who say, we will stand with you. This, this is what they did. And they prayed. I love this. Look at, 
I want you to see this. I'll give you an example. Verse 24, and they, when they heard, when they heard it, they lifted their voices together. I've actually been a part of a prayer service that um, causes me to think of this text. I've shared it with you before. I'll be brief. I was with um, pastors from Mortal Life Ministries in Florida, and we flew up on a Tuesday morning to go to Brooklyn Tabernacles prayer meeting um, in Brooklyn, New York, down, downtown Brooklyn, New York. We, we go into this prayer meeting that starts at seven o'clock, doors open at 530. Um, and, and we go there because we, we were longing to be people who prayed and we read Jim Simbel's book, Fresh Wind and Fresh Fire. Uh, and, and we just wanted to go kind of be a part of that, that service. And so we, we go there and we, we, notice that there's already a line going outside waiting to get in for a prayer meeting. Okay, in case you weren't surprised, that's, typ- that's not typical. <laughs> like if I say, hey, we're gonna have a prayer meeting Monday, be like eight of us that come in. I'm just gonna be honest, it's just my experience. Here, we show up and a line is going down the street. I'm like, this is crazy. They open the door. They ask you to kind of keep it reverent, keep, stay quiet. Um, and so we walk in. There's people that were praying already before the service even started at the stage. There's some music going. There's people praying for each other. There's a guy there. Literally, he had his arms like this the entire time until the service started. Like he was just praying. Blew me away. So I didn't know what to expect. We uh, were there. This place is filled 6,000 plus people. It's crazy. Um, just for a prayer service. And uh, Jim Simbler comes out and says, all right, we're going to pray. And he has a list of things that we're going to pray for. Like there's no, you know, sermon, anything like we're just, we're just going to pray. We came here to pray. We're going to pray. And so here's, here's the craziest moment I've ever experienced. I'm standing up with everyone else, 6,000 people. And Jim Simbler says, let's pray for this. And like a rushing wind, Everyone prayed out loud for that very thing. And I don't, I don't know if you've heard 6,000 people pray out loud. It was insane. I've never seen anything like it. Since then, never heard anything like it. Like they took seriously when we came together to pray, we're going to pray. It wasn't, okay, pray if you'd like to, pray in your hearts, pray quietly. We'll go around the circle. If you feel uncomfortable, pray, squeeze the hand of the person next to you. Either way, n- no, they pray. Everyone prayed. I wonder, I wonder if being with Jesus and filled with the Holy Spirit, any kind of uh, pride or desire for a certain reputation goes away and we just abandon our lives for him and him alone. So, so they prayed. Um, then my fourth thing, my, my last thing, uh, Abby, you can make your way forward. My, my last point is this. Those who have been rescued, redeemed and filled with the Holy Spirit and have been with Jesus committed to togetherness and faithfully devoted themselves to unprompted generosity. Did you see what happened when they prayed? Let me show you again. As they were praying, verse 31, when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. Similar to Pentecost, where tongues of fire came down. Another tangible manifestation of God's presence showed up to underpin and strengthen the believer's faith. As they prayed, the place was shaken. Okay. As they prayed, the place physically was shaken. Wouldn't that terrify you? Every once in a while, we have a train that goes by. It's loud. What's crazy to me is I've been in the church game. I've been in a long time. I had a phone call um, yesterday from a pastor 
And he's like, hey, uh, how you doing, Jeremy? I was like, I'm doing good, man. How are you? He's like, kind of sucks. <laughs> I'm like, man, what's going on? He's like, you know, just church things. And then he said this, which was so disheartening, but so true. He says, Jeremy, you've kind of become my guy to call because you understand. I don't need to explain it. I can just call you and say, it's a tough season. Because what's happened is we've created an environment in the church circles where people are chasing. They're chasing the experience and not devoting themselves to togetherness and generosity. And so pastors are getting worn down by trying to put on a show, to make it bigger and wower than the last week, to get people to feel it again so they can say, man, I haven't felt the presence of God like that in a long time, to do things that stir up some type of emotional response so we can just put all the energy in doing it again today while they work for nothing and get called for everything. When they had a prayer meeting that shook the building, they didn't come together and say, how can we have that again? Their response wasn't to chase after another shaking. In Acts chapter 2, when tongues of fire came down and they had this a supernatural, tangible moment of God moving, do you remember what they did, their response? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread and togetherness, and to prayer. And they made sure they took care of everyone who was in need. Their response to a miraculous move of God wasn't to chase the miraculous movement. It was to love the people in front of them. And here in this text, we have another moment where they come before God and they pray and the building shakes and it shakes tangibly to encourage and motivate their faith. But their response afterward is that here's what we're going to do. We're going to be of one heart and of one soul and no one was in need. I don't know what song it is. I don't, I don't want to throw them out. Like, But miracle after miracle after miracle. No. If God decides to show up in a supernatural way, let it cause us to want to love people well, not want it again. I think we've done it. We've done it so wrong. Instead of pleading and begging for people to be generous and chasing after God to be generous, maybe... Maybe what we need to do is thank him for being generous and then unprompted be generous with ourselves. So, so, so here's what we have. We have five people getting baptized. Amy, I didn't tell you earlier, but can you come up to my left? All right. um, those who are being baptized can follow her. Come up to this front side, left, my left, your right. Band can, can make your way up. Um, here's what I know. What I know is I don't like to play the games anymore. And I want to be a church that thrives on together, togetherness. And as we get ready to do these baptisms, um, man, we're going to sing and we're going to celebrate. But maybe what, what it's going to do here is stir within all of us. To not continue to chase the emotional sensationalism that's being preached and taught anymore. But to say thank you, God, for being so generous by rescuing and redeeming my heart that was made of stone and replacing it with a heart of flesh. By filling my life, my heart, my body with your spirit. Th thank you for being so good to me for allowing your son to pay for all of my sin. And, and, because, and because you have done all that, because of your generosity, Lord, here's my response is to be generous. 
is to love people well, is to point people to Jesus as the only one who can save, is to be one who looks at needs and sees needs and says, I want to help in this area because we need to be a church that is of one heart and of one soul because there's only one name by which people can be saved. And that name is Jesus. Now, with that, I'm gonna come down here. Water's brown. You guys come up here, please. Just make a line. Did they put you first? Okay. All right, um, you can face here. I'm just line up. I'm gonna ask you guys some questions one at a time. Cadence, we already talked about this. Have you professed your belief and trust in Jesus? Yes. Are you committed to moving forward in your journey with him? Yeah. Um, Kylie, come here. Let's do this together. Kylie, have you professed your faith and trust in Jesus? Yes. Are you committed to moving forward in your journey with him? Yes. Um, so here's the river. Angel, have you professed your belief and trust in Jesus? Yes. Are you committed to continue to walk in with him from this moment forward? Yes. The third question I ask in this church, because togetherness matters, is I have three ladies up here. Would those ladies in this room who are committed to walking this out with them stand to let them know they're not alone in this journey. I, I want you two to know as younger generation, the ladies in this room are willing to walk this thing out with you. You're not alone. Hey, Angel, you're, you're, you're not alone. You, you have women who are here who say, I'll do this thing with you. You may be seated. Sean, what's up, buddy? Have you pro professed your faith and trust in Jesus? Yes, I have. Are you committed to walking this out, this journey with him from this moment forward? Yeah. Riley, have you professed your faith and trust in Jesus? Yes. Are you committed to walking this out, this journey with him, this moment forward? Yes. Are there uh, are there any men in this room who are willing to stand with these two men as they walk this thing out? Would you stand? Yeah. So when you don't want to talk to me as your dad, take your pick, buddy. They'll love you well. They'll love you well. Can everyone stand as we pray with them? Father, we praise you and thank you for this moment. For the lives changed in this room, for the ones committed to serving and loving you, for these that are getting baptized here this morning, my prayer is that you remind them that you are walking with them, that you go before them, that there's no weapon formed against them that will prosper that there is nothing that can separate them from the love that's found in your son, Jesus Christ. <sighs> Encourage them. Surround them with people who will help them walk the thing out. But Father, this portion of our service is to celebrate not only what you're doing in the lives of these five, but what you're doing in the lives of all of us in this room. And Father, so it's our, our prayer to give you our heart, to sing, to praise, to let you know how beautiful and wonderful you are. And thank you for your son, Jesus. And we ask this in his name. Amen. For those of you who are family, the way this goes, you can make your way up here if you want to. Um, stand, keep standing, don't sit. Or if you want to sit, you can, but stand, preferably. Um, we do this in a public, private way. So the next moment is me having a moment with them as we do the baptism while you guys get to sing because there's no better way to celebrate what's going on here than to sing together. So they're going to lead you in a song as we do this up here. But if you're family and you'd like to come up and experience this, you can.
I give you my life. I give you my trust, Jesus. For you are my God, and you are enough, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, sing my heart. Take it all, take it all, my life in your hand. My heart is yours, my heart is yours. Take it all, take it all, my life in your hands. Cause I lay down my life and I take up my Jesus, for you are my God, whatever the cost, Jesus, oh Jesus, we sing my heart is yours. Take it all, take it all, my life in your hands. My heart is yours, my heart is yours. Take it all, take it all, my life in your hands. Take it all, take it all, my life in your hands. And all to Jesus. Sing that again, oh, and all to Jesus I surrender all to you I freely Oh, I will ever love and trust you in your presence. Sing that chorus. Cause my heart is yours. My heart is yours. Take it all, take it all. My life in your hands. My heart is yours. My heart is yours. Take it all, take it all. My life in your hands. Take it all, so take it all. Take it all, my, come on, sing, take it all, take it all. So take it all, take it all, my life in your hands. And all to Jesus, I surrender all to you, I freely give. Trust you in your presence. I will live, oh yes, and all to Jesus. I surrender to you. I freely give. Oh, I will ever love and trust you in your. Sing, cause I lay down my life Cause I lay down my life And I take up my cross Jesus For you are my God Whatever the cost Jesus 
Oh, Jesus. I lay down my life and I take up my cross. Because I lay down my life and I take up my cross. Jesus. Oh, for you are my God. Oh, whatever the cost, I'm yours. Jesus, I am yours, oh, Jesus, Jesus, my heart is yours, my heart is yours, take it all, take it all, my life in your head, oh, my heart, my heart, you can have it all. Take it all, take it all, my life's in your oh, take it all, so take it all, take it all, my life in your hands. Sing all to Jesus and all to Jesus. Let's give another hand clap, shout, whatever you feel God leading you. This is an awesome moment here today. Let's go to him in prayer together with me. Let's pray together. Father, there's no salvation without Christ. There's salvation in no other name than our Lord Jesus Christ. And we are thankful that we get to see the results, the fruit of that, of you laying down your life here today in this baptism. And God, I pray for each and every soul that was baptized here today and, and, and our commitment together as a church that we would take that stand and be together with you in support and care for each and every person. And God, let that extend out into our whole congregation, into each and every person, every soul that's in this place. May we together, God, just like that church in Acts, that we be devoted to your words. We be devoted to you, to just living out this thing, not just personally, God, but publicly together as your church, reaching into the lives of each and every person around us. It takes that initiative, God. It takes us being confident in that and what you are doing and allowing you to, to touch our hearts and to lead us into that. And God, here today, we commit ourselves to that. Can I, can I say that together as a church body here to get today, that we're gonna commit to that? Let's do that. God, by your power, by your strength, by your spirit, that will happen. We are committing ourselves to that. And you are faithful to your promises. You are faithful even when we're faithless, God. God, may we be just, just allow you to, to let that settle in our hearts and our minds each and every day. And God, we know there is an enemy out there that will try to dissuade us that, that the flesh that we have will want to live in angst and in fear. But God, your love is greater. Your mercy is greater. Your grace is greater. In those moments, draw us out. Remind us of the power of the gospel, the power of the resurrection. God, we get to celebrate that here soon. And remember that. Your power, your strength. You never leave us nor forsake us. You're always with us. May we settle into that. May we rest in that, abide in that from John 15 and allow you to do what you want to do in us and through us as your church. Lord, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Restored Church Podcast. If you would like more information about our church, visit our website at www.restoredchurchonline.com or join us in person on Sundays at 1020 a.m. 
Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss a single message and share with a friend. Thank you again for listening.